folks, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Praise the Lord for Sundays. Isn't it great that we can gather together and worship him, even if we still are online just at the moment? And of course, at 11 o'clock this morning, after this service, we will be on Zoom for fellowship and discussion. So please do come along and join us then. Shall we come to the Lord this morning, declaring our trust in his loving kindness as we join with all God's people here with the ancient words from Psalm 17. I call on you, O God, for you will answer me. Give ear to me and hear my prayer. Show the wonder of your great love, you who save by your right hand, those who take refuge in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Isn't that beautiful? We are the apple of the Lord's eye. We are hidden in the shadow of his wings. And we come together this morning to worship and praise him. As I mentioned before, we're online this week and next week, but then on the 27th of June, we will, God willing, be back in our building. And if you haven't seen our news update yet on YouTube with the accompanying email, I'd encourage you to check that out. That will give you a bit of information and a bit more detail of what we hope is going to be taking place. Of course, although we have not been able to meet together very much at all physically over the past 15 months, Rosedale Community Church certainly has not been inactive. If you'll recall, um, when the first lockdown took place in March 2020, we very quickly moved all of our services, our Bible study, our prayer groups online, along with Zoom coffee mornings and afternoon tea. We immediately mobilised to provide emergency food and shopping and picking up medication to those who were shielding. And we have um, helped and supported and provided pastoral care to quite a lot of those people in need. I joined the Broxbourne Coronavirus Community Partnership, which worked extremely hard and still does to make sure that no one was slipping through the cracks, but everybody was able to get some care and help. We began the budgeting course to support those who needed help with their finances and we helped get the food pantry started. Between us all as a church congregation, we've sought to be family, to encourage each other. And as we come out of this lockdown, um, we are um, hoping that churches and the community venues can open up fully and that once again we'll be offering our 50s plus, our Butterfly Babes group and all of our youth work. As you know, we are very excited that Joel is going to be joining us in September as an intern. And along with our lovely newly refurbished building, we believe that God is moving us into a new season, a new season of worship and a new season of service to him. One of the things that we've always sought as a church is to recognise and encourage the gifts of those who are part of the family. You know, to be a safe place for people to learn how to serve God and to be able to actively seek his call on their lives. And one of the people that we have watched grow and develop over the past 13 years is Becky Green. Now I do realise that Becky is my daughter and I unashamedly admit to being totally biased, but many of you also have been there as she first began telling her friends about Jesus, as she joined Joe and Adrian's group singing up front, as she's helped lead holiday Bible clubs, as she was baptised, learned the guitar, led the youth, took a key role in the cafe church, and served at all the community events in the church for years. Becky's leadership skills are recognised among us at Rosedale, in her school, and in the other activities that she's involved in, such as at the Lee Valley White Water Centre and Intense Youth Camp. Well, in September, Becky's going to be 18 years old, and she'll be with us just one final year before heading off to university. And we, the church leadership team, would actually like to recognise Becky's leadership qualities and also give her the invaluable experience of being part of our church leadership team for this next year, 
as training for her future, hers and whichever church it is that she's going to end up in and serving. So watch with me this short clip of Sheila and Becky in conversation. Oh, Becky, I remember you arriving at Rosedale as a little girl four years old. So you're very much part of our family and we've watched you grow into a godly young woman. Can you share with us a little bit about what following Jesus means to you? Following Jesus means um, to walk in faith and to walk uh, forsaking everything just because you trust him and his, his plans for you and your life. And I very much believe that to be present in mine. Um, to live with the zeal and, and um, passion, enthusiasm to spread the word of Jesus and share it, have such a grounded personal faith that you know to share it with others. Yeah, that's yeah. lovely. Over the past few years you've served us as a worship leader and youth leader. What have you enjoyed most about these roles? I've loved seeing how it's impacted the congregation, and how um, the young people have grown up and mm. they know so much about the Bible and they're, they, yeah, they have their, they've built their own relationship from just sharing, sharing um, my experience and seeing how they've built their own. Uh, it's very, yeah, it's very inspiring mm. and just, yeah, just seeing how their lives have grown and developed over time is quite nice. Yeah, yeah that's good. What do you feel a key element of being a leader in the church is? Uh, being able to have, just having um, your own dream and having a vision for, to see like where the church is going, but not being so grounded in that vision that you're not willing to accept new ideas. Mm. So it'd be like just, yeah, accepting whatever comes our way and being able to adapt and um, yeah, just being able to share like, yeah, to what God has in store. Yeah. So you've only just one year left of A-levels and then you'll be heading to university in September 2022. Where do you plan to go and what will you be studying then? Uh, I want to go to Nottingham University mm. and studying um, Biblical Studies and Theology. So, yeah, it's theology, but they do both religious studies and um, both biblical. But I think I know my Bible a bit more better than other religions, so I wanted yeah. to dive into that instead. Yeah, good. I realise at this stage you probably only have a vague direction of where the Lord is leading you in the future. But what do you sense it will include? Uh, missionary work, uh, in ministry, I think, uh, maybe with young people, a bit of worship in there. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah. I kind of want to go out of my comfort zone and, um, and yeah, just be challenged in my own faith, but be able to spread it and uh, share with others. Yeah, then lastly, why would you like to be part of the leadership team at Rosedale? I think... Um, I don't know, I think I've got lots of enthusiasm for uh, the ministry work that we can do and I'd love to have my own ideas and see where, just see where we get in the next year, just growing, especially after Covid, just yeah, have an input into the leadership of the church and see where we get really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think you'll make a very valuable member. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila and Becky. Thank you very much for that. Well, in accordance to our guiding principles of fellowship, we at Rosedale, the leadership team, would like to recommend that Becky joins the team from September. She'll be turning 18, and as this will also link in with Joel's appointment, um, you know, we, th we figure this will be a really exciting opportunity for them to learn together and really complement our leadership team as the voice of the younger generation. Whilst Joy, Joel's appointment is as a student and a trainee, Becky's appointment is slightly different and you, the congregation, gets to vote for her. So on Sunday the 11th of July we plan to hold a church meeting where you get to say whether you agree or not that Becky should be a member of the leadership team. Voting can be done in person on that morning 
or beforehand by sending either an email to Simon or by placing a ticked ballot paper in the post box in the church hall, which will be open from the 27th. So we are intentionally announcing this a whole month in advance so that you can figure out the best way of making your wishes known. And of course, if you have any questions or comments or would like to chat things over, then please do contact one of the leadership team. We always, always love to hear your thoughts and to gain feedback from you. But now this morning, we're going to turn to our message. This is our final sermon in our series on Paul, the man and his message. And over the past few weeks, we have followed Paul on a few of his adventures. We've considered his teaching in light of those experiences. Well, today we come to the final chapter of the book of Acts. Paul has arrived in Rome. He is a prisoner awaiting to be seen by the emperor. He is being permitted to live in his own accommodation, but with a guard and under house arrest. So he can't leave his residence. Joel is bringing us our Bible reading this morning. So this is Acts 28, verses 17 to 30. Three days after Paul's arrival, he called together the local Jewish leaders. He said to them, brothers, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Roman government, even though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our ancestors. The Romans tried me and wanted to release me because they found no cause for the death sentence. But when the Jewish leaders protested the decision, I felt it necessary to appeal to Caesar even though I had no desire to press charges against my own people. I asked you to come here today so we could get acquainted and so I could explain to you that I am bound with this chain because I believe that the hope of Israel, the Messiah, has already come. They replied, we have had no letters from Judea or reports against you from anyone who has come here, but we want to hear what you believe, for the only thing we know about this movement is that it is denounced everywhere. So the time was set, and on that day, a large number of people came to Paul's lodging. He explained and testified about the kingdom of God and tried to persuade them about Jesus from the scriptures. Using the law of Moses and the books of the prophets, he spoke to them from morning until evening. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. And after they had argued back and forth among themselves, they left with this final word from Paul. The Holy Spirit was right when he said to your ancestors through Isaiah the prophet, go and say this to this people. When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see. And their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand. And they cannot turn to me, and let me heal them. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles, and they will accept it. For the next two years, Paul lived in Rome at his own expense. He welcomed all who visited him, boldly proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one tried to stop. Thank you, Joel. That's great. Well, you have to admit, this is a strange end to the story. In fact, it, it's very obvious that it isn't really an end at all. I mean, Luke, the writer of Acts, does not tell us what happens. Does Paul meet with Caesar? And what is the result? We do know from other writings and early Christian tradition that actually tells us that Paul was released after two years, that he then possibly completed a fourth missionary journey before being rearrested and taken back to Rome and martyred there by Nero um, around the same time that Nero also martyred and killed the Apostle Paul. 
But this passage, this passage is the last definitive biographical information that we have about Paul. And it is so typically Paulish. You know, the circumstances are messy. And at the end of a very weird and messy journey that involves shipwrecks and being bitten by venomous snakes and lots more people coming to Christ, you know, um, he ends up in Paul in Rome and God has been with him and is still with him. And although Paul may not be allowed to leave his prison house, well, that's not going to stop him. That's not going to stop him preaching the gospel. You know, doesn't it make you smile to read how he calls the Jewish leaders to come to him so that he could speak to them and share the gospel? Of how greater and greater numbers come to his home to listen and to debate. And that last verse is fantastic. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, just flash back a moment to when we first met Paul. He was standing there in Jerusalem, just outside the gates of Jerusalem, holding the cloaks of those who were stoning Stephen, and he was approving of the murder. Now, towards the end of his life, Boldly and without hindrance, he preaches the kingdom of God and teaches about the Lord Jesus Christ. This was Paul. This was his love, his first and primary calling to be a teacher and a preacher. And this is what he was to the end. You know, there is such an amazing, wonderful tenacity about Paul a single-minded and focused intensity where he will not be swayed by anything else. I, I wonder, I wonder, was he an easy guy to live with? You know, we'll never know that. What we do know is that Paul never gave up, but gave all of himself to the mission of Christ, preaching the kingdom of God with all his heart. He took the final commission of Jesus seriously. Listen to these final words from Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Paul took that command seriously. As a missionary and apostle, he went to more nations than anyone else had ever done. In Romans 15, he expresses it in his own words. Therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way round to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. I love Paul's honesty and understanding. He doesn't try to hide that he is ambitious and he's got dreams, but actually he says, look, my ambitions, my dreams are so rooted in the call of God on my life to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. And so he did. This is what he gave the rest of his life to. He preached the gospel, seeing people saved, and then he discipled and pastored them. And whilst he did that in deed and in speech, you know, the true lasting treasure of Paul's ministry is that he also preached and teached and pastored by letter. Letters that survived and make up 24% of the New Testament. And really it is because of those letters that we know him so well. No other follower of Jesus has shaped Christianity as much as Paul did and, to be honest, still does. 
you know, his writings, because they are full of theology, the Christian faith and practice and pastoral care. It's his words that every generation since then has carefully studied to figure out how are we to live today? How are we to live as Christians following Jesus as members of the family of God? Do you ever wonder what Paul's reaction was when he found out that his letters were going to become part of the canon of scripture? I mean, it, it, that verse that he wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That scripture was going to apply to his work, to his letters. Wouldn't you have loved to have heard the conversation in heaven around about AD 330, when the canon of the Bible was set? I mean, just picture it, the dialogue between Paul and Peter, Luke and John over the inclusions of all their works in the New Testament. You know, and then Matthew and Mark arrive with looks of baffled astonishment that, that their gospel stories are in there too. You know, I kind of wonder, did the group of them, did they wander off to find Moses, you know, to get a bit of wisdom and perspective on, on how he coped with being such a famous author for God? Uh, OK, OK. I admit my imagination is running away with me, you know, but but I can't help wondering, you know, if Paul ever wished he'd express something slightly differently, you know, or included more or if he hears us discussing his teachings and meanings, you know, would he get frustrated and scowl and say, I never meant it that way? What I think is amazing and wonderful and so obviously Holy Spirit inspired and God honouring is how consistent Paul is in his letters. Yes, there are several seemingly, you know, minor contradictory verses. But when you understand that these letters were written over several decades to different folk in different situations under differing circumstances, you know, then then these slight differences in comments make sense. You know, I was just rereading this week a letter that John sent me um, about five, six years ago, and I couldn't help smile at the words and phrases used that already seem really dated, you know, and we probably wouldn't use if we were writing them today. You know, that was only, only five years ago between the two of us. But Paul, Paul's message is consistently Jesus. What it means to believe in him and to follow him. Yes, of course, there are differences in tone. To the Corinthians who were divided and arguing constantly, he writes a pretty strong letter of instruction on harmony and unity. To the Thessalonians, you know, who were worried about the future, he writes a letter of consolation and encouragement. To the Galatians, who were listening to false teaching. I mean, Paul is more like a scolding parent telling them, pull your socks up, you know, and stick with the true gospel. Whereas to Timothy, he's like a father and a mentor, imparting wisdom to a treasured younger friend. You know, but through all the words, both spoken and written, again, we come down to the fundamental message. Paul's Paul's words, all of them, that he spoke and that he wrote, that he lived out, that he demonstrated, is that of the gospel, of the kingdom of Jesus, and the privilege to be followers of the Lord God, Father of all. Just listen, listen to these beautiful words from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 10. Paul writes this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely given us in the one he loves. 
in him we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Wow, wow, words of beauty and power and adoration of the Lord and an understanding of the full holistic picture of what it is to live as the people of God. And so as we come to the end of this series, what, what can we take today from God, Paul's example? You know, we've covered a lot of ground over the past few weeks, from facing our own prejudices to seeking a fresh encounter with Jesus, from living in the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit to joyfully proclaiming the gospel is for everyone without prejudice. There's been the whole suffering issue and the whole kind of rejoice when things are terrible topic. You know, and, and today, today we realise that actually the Great Commission hasn't changed. That evangelists, missionaries, preachers, teachers and pastors are still needed for the extension of the Kingdom of God today. Sometimes we read, go into the world and think, well, that's not for me because I can't really leave Chessent. You know, we see the big scope of Jesus' vision, but sometimes we actually forget that all the world kind of includes chess and tea. So what if we read, what if we read those last words in Matthew 28 that Jesus said? What if we were to read them this way? Go into all your house and make disciples. Go into all your workplace and make disciples. Go into all your neighbourhood and make disciples. Go into all your school, your football team, your fitness class, your women's institute and make disciples. Just pause for a moment and consider those people that you rub shoulders with each day or week or month. Are you sharing the good news of Jesus with them? What would Jesus be saying if he were interacting with in their lives? No, not everybody will respond, but some will. You know, and I love it that we do not have to be perfect for God to use us to share his love. In fact, it seems that God specifically picks out and chose, chooses those whose lives are not perfect, whose character may be slightly flawed and whose situations, yeah, they look a bit messy. Because you see, God looks at the heart's desire. He looks for those who will serve him with a passion and stickability and says, mm, well, they're definitely going to require work, but I can use a heart like that for my purpose and my glory, just as he did with the Apostle Paul. You know what? That's what I hope God sees when he looks at my heart. What about yours? I really hope that you'll join us on Zoom this morning so we can discuss this further and, and walk together in our discipleship of following the Lord. But shall we finish with a prayer? Let's do that. Father, over these past few weeks, we have considered your servant, Paul, the man and his message. It has been a journey of seeing your miraculous power and holiness at work in someone who began as a persecutor and a murderer to become one of the greatest influencers in the Christian world. Father, we are inspired by his example and your transforming power. Please shape us, create in us a new heart that is soft like Paul's, a heart that responds to your call, your guidance, your leading, that our ambitions and dreams are completely wrapped up in fulfilling the great commission to share the gospel, make disciples and teach folk your ways. Please, please help us to be aware of those around us who need to know your love. May we be open to your Holy Spirit's leading and ready to speak at all times about the name of Jesus. This we ask.
Amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you for joining with me here this morning. You take care. God bless you.